What's up my little nerds and welcome back to Moan Inc. If you guys are new here then what is up? My name is Erica. Hey, how you doing? And if you're into the history of the ancient Greeks and the Romans, maybe you're just into the mythology and maybe, maybe you're just here because you want to see a little bit more fighting in the Aeneid. Well then this is not only the video for you, this is also the channel for you. You guys are going to want to hit that subscribe button and the bell icon so you know every single time I post in the future. But on topic of today's video and as you can see from the title, we're going to be going into book 9 of Virgil's Aeneid. If I could summarize book 9 into one sentence, it would just be that irrelevant characters fight it out and die. Unfortunately, that is literally what happens in this book, and I do really want to harp on that right now, that there's a difference between Virgil and Homer in this instance, that when Homer has, you know, fight scenes in the Iliad, it was incredibly easy for me to figure out what fight scenes to focus on and what fight scenes not to focus on, because there are some that are done by characters that Homer will literally just introduce in order to then kill them both in different instances. However, in that series, what I could do was latch on to the fights that were happening. Maybe one irrelevant character was in that, but for the most part, it was just when vital characters were fighting, whether they were with an irrelevant character or not, I could at least, you know, latch on to those for you guys, because that way it was easier for you guys to follow the narrative, follow what the main characters were doing, X, Y, and Z. Virgil! Not as easy to do that with, and that's because Virgil, again, as we said in the introduction episode, this book is half the length of the Iliad, and so when he introduces characters, um, they, they are not fleshed out whatsoever. We don't know who they are. Their names are just introduced. Maybe their parents, maybe. And then they die in the same moment. And this book is a perfect example of that because where I left you in the last book, right? So Aeneas is coming back from uh, making his little alliance with Evander. And therefore he's not back down in the camp yet, which means that he cannot fight Turnus, which means that he's taken all of the famous characters and we are left with a bunch of weird Trojans that we don't know. And his son Ascanius to sort of lead them all, and then a bunch of Latins that we also don't know. And so therefore, this is a very long winded way of saying that this summary is going to be a little bit iffy because I'm going to be skipping out a lot in regards to you don't need to know this in order to understand the story. I will just be saying fight scenes or battles happen. But there are some battles that I do have to highlight, which are unfortunately just irrelevant characters. And so with those instances, I guess you can kind of just have, you know, names come in one ear and out the other, but just sort of to, you know, give this episode a little bit of flavor, I want to give it something because yeah, basically, you know, with all of that being said, instead of me just sitting here rambling, why don't we just roll into the narrative to make all of that make a little bit more sense. So as all of the stuff at the end of book eight is happening, right? So in the morning, you know, when Aeneas goes down, he's on his horses and all of this, they go down, he gets the armor, blah, blah, whatever, all of that, as that's happening, Juno sees that happening and she sends down Iris, who is her little messenger god, to go and speak to Turnus. When she gets down there, she says, all right, Turnus, Aeneas is now getting all of his men together. He's coming back to where we are now. He's coming back to fight and he's coming back with a lot of men to do so. So what exactly are you waiting for? Now is your time to go and actually attack the Trojans, take over the camp. And that way when Aeneas gets back, he's going to be hella shook that you have taken over his little camp and he won't know what to do. It doesn't matter how many horsemen he has with them. It doesn't matter how big of an army. It's still going to be a little bit jolting and he'll have to figure out a plan B. So that is my advice to you. And before Turnus can respond, and Iris just turns around and she f***s off, right? She does what every god does in this whole book where she just goes, all right, I said my piece, bye. And as she leaves, she actually leaves behind a rainbow behind her because she's also the goddess of rainbows for those of you guys who don't know. Goddess of rainbows leaves behind a rainbow and that is how Turnus knows that he was speaking to Iris herself. Now bear in mind that he has no idea who sent Iris and so he calls up to her and he asks who, who sent her, but obviously she doesn't reply because she's gone. And so instead he then raises up a prayer to the sky and he says, whoever sent Iris, I'm praying to you for good luck and all of this sort of stuff. And he picks up water from uh, the river and sort of, you know, throws it out and pours it out as like a libation and, and blah, whatever. He does what a pious man would do in this exact scenario, was the whole point of that. So Turnus decides to take the advice though and he rallies all of his army together and they start moving out from where the Latins are into the Trojan, the Trojan territory. I say that with inverted commons because it's just sort of, you know, where their camp is set up. They start advancing towards that area. Now, when they're all coming towards the Trojans, we have a lookout who goes under this name. Is it Caicus? <laughs> Someone tell me in the comments, but that's his name. Uh, C-A-I-C-U-S. Just so you guys know, I do know how to spell it, right? It's just a pronunciation. Again, not my forte, and that's not the point of my job here on YouTube. It's just to tell you who does what. So he is the guy who's on the Trojan walls and he sees the lands coming towards them. And he obviously sees them and is like, oh, this. In fact, he turns around and tells everybody to mount the walls. He tells everybody to get ready. But we hear from Virgil that that doesn't necessarily matter. And the reason why he's not telling them to get into battle and just to mount the walls is because apparently our 
King Genius Aeneas told all of the Trojans that in his absence they were not allowed to go out onto the plain in order to engage in battle, that they were instructed to wait for him to return. Which means that now there's a whole swarm of Rutulians, like hundreds of thousands of Rutulians walking towards them. They look, they're literally described, you guys, as like a cloud of dust, like black dust that is approaching them. That is how many of them there are, and yet all of them just literally have to stand on the walls and just go, well, let's just hope for the best. So with the Trojans mounted the wall and they are guarding their camps and they are as ready as they can be with the orders that they have been given, we then cut to the Rutulians who are now just running flat out against the Trojans and they're running up towards the walls. Turnus himself is in the lead and he's described as trying to find sort of an opening in the walls in the fortifications to try and get through, but he can't. There's the, it's, you know, solid, it's tight. And so he's running around, he's trying to figure out what to do and all of a sudden it clicks and he realizes that he could probably get inside. He could probably cause havoc via the fleets on the shore. And so that is where he starts cutting to right now to gain an advantage on the Trojans. Now Virgil tells us a little bit of a flashback in order to explain what is going to happen in real time. And so he tells us the story about how when the Trojans way back when, when Aeneas was like going to build the boats in order to leave Troy and all of this and you know, have the fleet, that actually it was the earth goddess who it goes by the name of Sibylle in Rome. So she is the one who granted, you know, the trees because she's the earth goddess. She grants the trees to the Trojans in order to make the boats. So that's like part of her, right, in the boats. This is all supposed to make sense. It will in a hot second, just wait. So in this little story, she goes to Jupiter and she explains this to him. And she says, you know, because they're a part of me, because I've done this, blah, 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 I'm really worried that in all of the seafaring and all of the shit that Aeneas has to face, that my boats, that my trees are going to then be punished and burned down because of this. So I need you to promise me that they will always be safe. And in this flashback, Jupiter says to her, of course, you have nothing to worry about. I will ensure that the boats, if anything, if maybe not the people, but the boats themselves will at least be fine because yes, they're a part of your Obama. He guarantees her in this moment that once the boats fulfill their task of bringing all of the Trojans to where they're supposed to be, that if they are ever in danger, Jupiter himself will turn them into uh, nymphs of the sea. So that's what he tells her that he's going to do. So now we flash back to the present moment and obviously Turnus is approaching. He's trying to set them on fire and all of this sort of stuff. The boats, Sibylle, Jupiter, everybody can see this happening. And so what happens is that the boats just randomly, literally randomly, they just sort of like a head first dive into the water and Turnus and everybody watching it is like, what the f is going on. So they just go head first into the water. The boats disappear into the Tiber River, right? We're not talking like a massive ocean, just, just the river. They just dive down and when they reappear, which, you know, you've got to think that the Tiber must have been really deep to absorb all of this boat. But either way, so it absorbs all the boat, they come back up and they are then sea nymphs. And so everybody's watching it just going, oh. So the point of that flashback was just to explain that really weird situation that happens with, with the boats. And when I say that everybody's terrified, I mean that the entire army of the Rotulians stop what they're doing to be like, what the actual f was that? Turnus, unfortunately, he turns around, he gives a speech to the Rotulians, but he incorrectly interprets this omen where he thinks that it's Jupiter abandoning the Trojans uh, by taking away their boats, not understanding what we know, which is that actually it was just a promise made to the earth goddess. However, uh, he interprets this as like, well, the Trojans are now because they don't have their ships anymore. That is clearly Jupiter abandoning them. We're gonna win. He then gasses himself up massively by saying, I don't need what Achilles needs. I don't need this great armor. I don't need like all of these other heroes, blah, blah, blah. I'm greater than them. And he tells the army that their plan moving forward is that when it comes to daylight, because now it's approaching night, that when it comes to daylight, they are just going to go and set the Trojans and their walls on fire, that that is his great grand plan. That he's like, now it's nighttime, we can all go back because, you know, we have time. Like it seems that the omen says that we're gonna win anyway. So we've got time to go and sleep, to go and rest and all this sort of stuff. So in the morning, that's the plan. We're gonna set fire to everything. And all of the men are like, great. And they all start moving back towards where the Latins uh, originally came from. Like, I don't know where that sentence was going. What I meant is that they're going back to their camps, right? <laughs> Good Lord, anywho. Now it's nighttime. And now we get two irrelevant characters that come into the story. However, they do a really cool thing. And that's why I'm mentioning them, okay? So we have at the middle of the night and the narrative cuts to the Trojans. And we have these two men who are standing on the walls and they're sort of keeping guard. One is called Nissus and one is called Euryalus. And both of them are talking. And Nissus at one point in the conversation looks over to Euryalus and he says, you know what? I bet actually I could get past all of the Rutulians where they are in the field. I bet you I could get past them and intercept Aeneas along the way so that I can tell him to hurry up and to come back down uh, to where we are, or at least to give us permission to start fighting outside on the plains. Because again, all they can do is defend 
the walls of uh, the camp that they have. So that's what Nissus presents. And he says this to Euryalus and he says, you know, you don't have to come with me. This is just my great plan, this, that, and the other. And Euryalus replies going, are you joking? You think that I would just let you do that on your own? Like that's, <laughs> that's so dangerous. I'm not letting you do that by yourself. No way I'm coming with you. So they have this great plan and they decide that they should go and tell Ascanius, Aeneas' son, about their great plan. So lucky for them, there's a council happening at this moment with all of the great Trojan and all of their, you know, great allies leaders and all of this. They're all having this little meeting in the middle of the night. Does this sound familiar if you've read the Iliad? It really should. But again, this channel is not analysis. The series even is not analysis at this point, And so therefore I'm not gonna be going into it, but this should have red light blinkers. Anywho, there is this council in the middle of the night between all of the leaders of the Trojans and their allies and in come Nissus and Euryalus. And when they come in, Nissus is basically bouncing on the spot. He's so excited to run his plan by them that Ascanius notices this and Ascanius says, all right guys, calm down because Nissus clearly wants to say something, we should let him speak. And so the pair of them explain their plan to the room. Very long story short, they explain their whole plan and everybody in there sort of takes in this breath and then they exhale because they're both nervous and also glad that somebody is willing to do this, but also this is basically a death sentence, right? Aletes, who's a really old guy who's in the meeting, he has a moment of screaming at them, just being like, you know, thank you so much for doing this, but this is so dangerous and blah, blah, blah. You're gonna have to do this, that, and the other. You'll have to be in the middle of it. Like, it has to be now that you do it, otherwise you won't make it out of life. Ascanius has to interject because this guy is so worked up by this. Ascanius interjects and he says, thank you guys for offering to do this. This is actually a massive help. Go and call back my father. And when you guys return, if you guys return. I promise great rewards for both of you. For Nissus, if you return, I will give you the horses of Turnus when we defeat him. We will take the horses and they will be yours. And for Euryalus, because you're a lot younger than Nissus and you're also younger than me, I will then give you the position of my comrade. You will be my right hand man, you will stand by me, and therefore I will then sort of guide you uh, into being a great warrior, into being a great man, and this, that, and the other. Both Nissus and Euryalus are very thankful for these offers. They are obviously overwhelmed because they didn't expect that. They just kind of wanted to do this thing and get the glory from performing this act. So they're very thankful. They thank Ascanius, they thank the other men uh, as well for supporting them and supporting their plan. However, Euryalus does pipe up for one second and he says, okay, I just need you guys to promise me something because my mum is here with us, right? So she's one of the women that we brought over. My mum is here. It's the middle of the night though and I really don't want to wake her up. Like I don't want to have to deal with her crying. I don't want her to stop me. I don't want any of you guys to do that either. You need to promise me that you will not go and tell her when I'm already gone what's happening. Like just, just let her find it out herself. Just, you know, wait until I come back in the morning. I'm sure it will be fine. She doesn't need to worry and she doesn't need to know. And so Ascanius agrees. Ascanius totally understands what he's talking about. He agrees. And in fact, then him and the other men in the room give Nissus and Euryalus uh, gifts in order to help them on their little quest in the middle of the night. Again, there should be alarm bells for the Iliad. Ascanius gives Euryalus a belt and a sword. We then have another guy that gives Nissus a lion hide, like a, like a lion sort of part of his skin, a lion skin, that's a better way of saying it. So a lion hide. And then we have the old man who gives them a helmet. He gives Nissus the helmet uh, that he is wearing. And so then they get sent off into the night to go and run across between one camp and the other to then go on to Aeneas. So this is a different situation, but again, this should be alarm bells for Diomedes and Odysseus from the Iliad from book 10 from the Night Raid. Hello, if you haven't watched that episode, you should be watching that episode there that I have already made where I fangled about that Night Raid. This Night Raid isn't as good and I'll explain that in a hot second. Let's slow down a little bit and get into it. So the pair move out, they move out onto the plains and as they move out and they start to get sort of into more Rutulian uh, uh, territory that actually when they get there, they see a lot of the guards have fallen asleep because they've drank too much wine. So they've fallen asleep, they're a little bit drunk and so the two men decide that they're going to take advantage of this and just start killing them in their sleep. Again, this is just like Diomedes, uh, except they're not drunk with sleep. They're all just asleep in the field and Diomedes kills all of them. Now we have two men who are killing all of these drunken men in the field. So they start going around and all of this and Euryalus kind of gets really caught up in killing all of these people and he actually takes a little more than he should. And Nissus even has to stop him. Nissus sort of gets in the way of him and literally killing somebody else, Euryalus and killing somebody else. He goes in the way and he goes, right, Pack it in. We only have so many hours until daylight and we have to go all the way to Aeneas. So let's just move. Euryalus though, again, gets caught up and he actually picks up one of the uh, spoils of his 
murders. He picks up a helmet. He also picks up a belt. That's also important, but the helmet is really the most important thing for the narrative in one second. Again, we'll get to it. So as the two men are then moving forward, they start to see a forest that appears on one side of them. And so now that is the safe place to go into. But as they are crossing over in front of the Rutulian camp and they are crossing over into the forest, they then get spotted and there are a lot of Rutulian men, a lot of Latins who are watching and who can see them running. And so one of them in particular who goes under this name, I don't know if it's Volscians or if it's Volkins. I don't know if it's a hard C or a soft C. Someone who's Italian, let me know. Anywho, he actually spots them because of the glittering helmet, right? So when Euryalus picks up that helmet, doesn't do them any good because in the nighttime it's super shiny and it's super sparkly. And so this guy notices and he literally calls out into the darkness, calls out into the night and he goes, HALT! Who the hell are you? Which obviously, Nissus and Euryalus scared shitless by this and they just run into the forest. They're just like, oh, no! Unfortunately, there are too many Rutulian, there are too many Latins outside. And so they all start packing into the forest after them. Now Nissus is a lot faster than Euryalus and Euryalus ends up getting surrounded and Nissus off, right? He starts running, starts running, starts looking around and then realizes that Euryalus isn't with him. So he turns around and sees him now surrounded by all of the Latins. And he's like, oh, come on. Very, very long fight scene short because these are two very irrelevant characters. And so therefore I don't want to harp on it too much. Basically what happens is that as Euryalus is about to be killed, Nissus then picks up his spear and he throws it into the middle. All of the Latins are like, what is going on? Where did that come from? They can't see in the darkness. They can't see where Nissus is, which then means that Nissus realizes that they're gonna kill him regardless. So he then jumps out of his hiding spot. He's like, no, I'm over here. The guy's innocent, blah, blah, blah. Kill me instead, come after me. Which obviously the Latins kill Euryalus and then they kill Nissus. It is a knockoff of the Iliad Night Raid, except the Iliad Night Raid was successful and it was way better than this one because now the both of them are just bodies in the forest. And I say bodies with a purpose because obviously they both die and the Latins are using this, going to use this as an example to the rest of the Trojans. So what do they do? The Latins chop off both of their heads, bring their heads back, leave the bodies, bring their heads back to the camps, put their heads on sticks, and then when daylight comes around, when dawn comes about, they start parading the sticks with Euryalus' head and Nissus' head um, outside the Trojan camp. So that happens. Very light story. As they're parading the heads around though, they start yelling up to all of the men. The men look over and they see this happening and all of them are chilled to the bone. Okay, they're terrified by this now because this is really, I mean, it's gross anyways, but also now they're just like, well, now what? We were just trying to get Aeneas to come back fast and now the two men who offered to do it are now dead and now their heads are being paraded around. So the people who didn't know that they had gone out on a night raid are like, what the fuck happened there? And the people who did know are like, well, we just sent them in there. Unfortunately, as happens a lot in this book, that rumor, the personification of rumor, gets down to Euryalus' mother, uh, who is in the Trojan camps and she does not handle this well, okay? She does the whole mourning thing. She does the whole, you know, yelling thing, pulling at her hair, beating her breasts, all of this sort of stuff. She does what a woman should do in this scenario. But again, Euryalus was minor character. His mother is an even more minor character because that is it. We never hear of them again that um, we know that he died, we know that she handles it really badly, and um, that just wraps up that little storyline. The Latins now start to actually advance and attack on the Trojan camps, right? So it is just the middle of the morning and they do not give the Trojans a time to even think, right? So they start attacking and they do it in a tortoise formation, right? So that is when all of the shields are like all around them so that that way, no matter what the Trojans do, that even though they're firing down at them, they're doing their absolute best, they cannot hit a single one of the Latins who are underneath this little tortoise formation. So the Latins are really strong today. In fact, they're doing what Turnus was doing yesterday, which is that they are constantly trying to find little weak points in the walls. They're getting really close. Basically, none of them are dying. And now Virgil evokes a muse to help him tell this part of the story because the last sort of part of the story is incredibly poetic and incredibly beautiful. But unfortunately, the only main character who has ever mentioned is Turnus. All of the rest of them, you will never ever need to know. So what Turnus does in his great first real big moment in battle is that Virgil tells us, evoked with the muse, of course, he tells us that Turnus lights a torch and he throws it up at one of the Trojan towers. And when he throws it up at the towers, it immediately catches fire and the whole tower comes tumbling down, right? So the Trojans are like, we are now, holy mother, loads of people, loads of Trojans who are in the tower die. It all comes down on the side of the walls. They are all completely terrified. This gives Turnus a lot of confidence and he goes on a killing spree. In fact, there are loads of names that are mentioned here and there are other Rutulians as well who do kill a number of the Trojans. We get lots of names. We get lots of back and forth. It's not very important for the summary. What you just really need to know is that there's a lot of fighting after this tower comes down 
that gives all of the Rutulians enough confidence to go in and to really push back against the Trojans. On the other side, it gives the Trojans zero confidence. They're like, we're in trouble now. We're basically a dying race again. And while all of them are panicking, Ascanius realizes that he kind of needs to step up to the plate now. So he gets his bow. He picks up his bow, which Virgil tells us has never ever gone into a person. It's only ever been fired at animals. And now he picks up this bow and he decides to fire it at the Rutulians and he kills this man called Numanus. I think is his name, N-U-M. Again, on my notes, I didn't even write this down, but I think it's N-U-M-A-N-U-S, Numanus. But that's the guy that he kills. Before you think that this was a random firing and a random kill, it actually wasn't, that Virgil tells us Ascanius was being sort of goaded by this guy. This guy was yelling up at him all this abuse about the Trojans and all about the Trojan war and how they're like a really petty race and all this sort of stuff. And so Ascanius targets him and he fires at him and he shoots him. And then he sort of relays the goading, but from the Trojan point of view, back at this now dying Rutulian man. And as he does this, we cut to Apollo because Apollo is watching this whole scene play out. And Apollo is well impressed. Okay, so let's bear in mind that Apollo loves the Trojans, but he also is the god of archery. So he's well impressed with Ascanius. And he says in this moment that now the gods acknowledge him as a man and not as a boy. So he takes on the form of another Trojan and he goes down to Ascanius and he just tells him that he's now done his dues and now he is not supposed to be on the battlefield. He needs to be protected because he has a better future than this current battle. He has to do things in the future, so therefore he can't put himself in danger right now. Now, even though Ascanius really does want to fight, like we're told that he has this like thirst for battle now, he does trust the god and he knows that it's Apollo who is in front of him because Apollo literally when he finishes talking just fades. He doesn't even turn around and walk away, he just fades. So he knows that it was a god and because of that, he then goes, okay, cool, yeah, no problem, I'm gonna pack it in. And he then decides not to fight because that's what Apollo has told him. So all of these things are slowly building the Trojan confidence, right, on their side in the Trojan battles. Like slowly, slowly they're being like, hey, well maybe we're not completely f And so they open the gates a little bit because again, they're not allowed on the plane, but they do want to get engaged with battle. And it doesn't go well, like all of the Rutulians are just really, really mad and start to really fire in through the gates. And so there are these two Trojans, there are these two, well, Trojan allies who are noted in this moment and they're not important because they, this is it, this is their only moment. So their names are not that important, but however, there are two of them. They're described as being like a tower. Who does that sound like? It should sound like Ajax if you're a fan of the Iliad. If not, I just told you who it sounds like. So these two men, like towers, standing in the front as they see the gates open. One of them panics so much because he sees how the Rutulians are coming in and how bloodthirsty they are. Now again, the intention was not to have the Rutulians come in. The intention was to get some of the guards outside the walls, not onto the plane, but just outside of the walls. And then now to get some of them back in, not to necessarily have all the Rutulian army back into their camp. That's obviously not a good thing. So he goes forward to close the gates and he's trying to close it behind all of the guards that they had just let out, all the guards who were outside anyways. So he's trying to close the gates. And unfortunately in amongst all of these Trojans and Trojan allies, Turnus manages to come into the camp. Turnus comes into the camp and he's in the middle of a lot of these Trojan people. And when he comes in, the two guys who were like a tower, they're not that sturdy apparently. They were not made that well because Turnus cuts them both down. He does have epic showdowns with both of them, but again, you don't really need to know that. You just need to know that he comes in and he kills the two tower-like people who are at the gates trying to defend uh, the Trojan camp. But in this moment, because he's so gassed that he managed to kill these two people who are huge, they're much bigger than him, they're much more powerful than him. He's so gassed and so distracted that Virgil tells us if he wasn't in this state and he was actually thinking rationally and he had opened the gates in this moment to let in the Rutulians, then the Trojan race would have died then and there. That actually if Turnus was not so confident, was not so celebratory in his kills, he could have literally ended them all in that moment. But he doesn't open the gates and instead in this moment he starts running around the camp and starts killing everybody that he can at least see and get to. Word gets round so a lot of the Trojans start coming forward going, you're telling me who is it what? And so they start advancing on Turnus and Turnus starts realizing he's bitten off a, a little bit more than he can chew. We're told that he dives into like a little party, a little frenzy of Trojans to try and fight them off single-handedly. He tries this twice and then again sort of comes to the conclusion that he can't do this by himself. And so he now needs to look for an escape. He now needs to get out of the camp. 
And the only way he can do that, because now he's completely surrounded by Trojans who have all started running towards where he is to try and make sure that he dies, he realizes that the only way he can get out is by jumping into the river. And so he goes to that side of the camp, he jumps into the river and he swims up to where the Rutulian camp is. And that is where the book ends. That Ternus is fine, a bunch of completely irrelevant characters died and Ascanius is totally fine as well. Uh, and Aeneas is still not in battle. He comes back in in a hot second. But a lot of these plot points were important to get through. I did not give you as many names as I should have. And I know this is technically oversimplifying the crap out of book eight. I'm completely aware if there are any classes watching this, I know what I've done. Please do not hate on me too much in the comments. So thank you guys so much for tuning into this video. We'll be seeing you next time with more videos here on Monique. I'll see you then.